Good morning, everyone, or good afternoon. Uh, great session we've got started here and a huge attendance that we've got uh, for this very exciting uh, session here on 3D manufacturing. What we're going to be doing today is going through, uh, go briefly through the introductions here. We're going to share the survey results with you. Uh, some of those highlights uh, that you participated, that many of you just uh, participated in. We'll cover a little bit about disruptive manufacturing. And then uh, as our special guest today, I have uh, Greg Elfring from 3D Systems uh, joining us today. And I'll go into a little bit more detail on 3D Systems here in just a moment. And uh, then we'll wrap it up with uh, some innovative technology uh, capabilities here and uh, close with a Q&A with our panel here. So keep your questions uh, uh, if you would, to, to the end here, we're looking forward to uh, gathering uh, some great information. Uh, my background here is a manufacturing, uh, as our moderator today, a strong manufacturing background. And uh, the small world, I remember 3D manufacturing from when it first started out. Uh, typically, it was in the prototype lab uh, with some of the stereolithography. We have come a long ways with that today, and Greg's going to be covering where we're at today, and it's really a whole new world in the 3D manufacturing environment as we go forward. So let's get started with our survey results here. And uh, one of the big things you see here is about 50% of you are saying, you know, I'm really wanting to see and waiting to see the viability and benefits to this. But the other 50% of you are really starting to, you know, really engage in this marketplace, engage in the technology as you go forward here. Uh, majority, as we thought, speed of prototyping, enhancing that innovation, but then also getting down what we're starting to see is a growth in that uh, supplementing the current supply chain. So really moving that 3D manufacturing into the production environment as you go forward, perhaps for slow moving parts, perhaps for very complex parts that are going forward. What are some of your drivers uh, that are uh, influencing you here? You know, the high cost of product introductions and testing. We know that engineering has always been a, a major issue, and you've got to get it right to start with. So that 3D capability gives you that capability going forward. What are some of the, uh, the key barriers? Is really understanding that relevant applications and benefits. And we're hoping that uh, today you're going to get some uh, real good insight here from the folks at, uh, at 3D Systems and really understanding uh, the, the, the whole 3D environment as you go forward and getting a handle on that cost of the equipment and such as you go forward. What we're seeing here, moderate impact for over 52% of you here. Um, no impact, only 2%. 20% major impact to your business. So this is really exciting. It's good to see that the folks here on the, on the call that uh, are really going to say and embrace this uh, technology as we go forward. Do you think your, your current IT infrastructure is well suited? Well, 20% of you said, you know what, absolutely it is. But, you know, if I take a look at it, 34% say that uh, they anticipate some modifications. And, you know, we're going to start seeing this here as we go forward, that this industry is in a state of flux, that there's going to be a lot of changes here and modifications to your existing business environment, your existing supply chain, and such are going to take uh, have to be changed here as you go forward. What we see here is people are very optimistic. You on the call, you're very optimistic, 50% of you, 56% of you optimistic. And, uh, the, and convinced, only 12% are a little bit skeptical And uh, as we go forward here. So let's go ahead and start off. You know, one of the things that this really brings and this whole conversation really brings is the fact of disruptive manufacturing and innovation. What really is disruptive manufacturing? You're going to be creating new markets, new values. Perhaps it's a new industry, a new region of the world, or improving a product or service. That is what we're going to be focusing on here with disruptive innovation and manufacturing. The fact is 3D manufacturing is a disruptive technology as you go forward. Embrace it, and you have a winning solution as you go forward. Some of our manufacturing technologies, many of us know this, are operations issue. How can we bring products to market faster? How can we reduce our manufacturing cords? We're seeing shorter life cycles. More complexity in the product. You know, one of the things we're starting to see is uh, that products are becoming uh, much, much more complex and requiring a lot more collaborative engineering and therefore a lot more of this uh, very quick-to-market uh, capabilities as we go forward. Your customers are demanding it. Higher value, higher quality, lower prices. You've got to get it right the first time. Taking a look at the corporate activities, the corporate uh, issues as you're driving forward here. Revenue growth, 
margin and profit growth. You can't let any of those things slip. And wrapping it up here with compliance, whether it be global regulatory, whether it be industry standards, other manufacturing uh, and, and compliance issues. You've got to have all this uh, in, in sync and in process here as you go forward and how to be more competitive as you go forward. Well, what we see is 3D manufacturing and 3D additive processing really is starting to move into the mainstream here. The mainstream of manufacturing, it's getting out of the laboratory into the production floor here. You know, if we take a look going back uh, with Chuck Hall and uh, going back about 19, I believe it was 82 or 83, you know, many, many changes uh, to these machines as we're going forward here. And what we're seeing is some real exciting capabilities as we move forward. What industries does this affect? Obviously, aerospace with the exotic materials, high value, low volumes, but has to be exacting and uh, high, to high uh, tolerance, high uh, capabilities. The dental and medical field, huge opportunity here with dental prosthetics and uh, getting it uh, you know, really custom to the, uh, to the patient here as they go forward. We're seeing in the automotive industry, you know, an industry that typically has been uh, fairly stoic in its, its, uh, its products. And we're starting to see this really catch on, not only in the, uh, in the prototyping environment, but even for the aftermarket, for those slow-moving parts. You know, be, you go out and take a look at trying to obtain products that uh, no longer are those molds or tools available and being able to do laser-centered parts, low volume, but, boy, I'll tell you what, they can really, this might be the only way that you're ever going to get some of those parts from the, uh, let's say, the 1965 uh, vintage cars and before. And then, of course, in the consumer specialty market, too, as well. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over here to Greg. And uh, Greg is, has been in this industry. He represents uh, 3D Systems here, and uh, 3D Systems has been a huge player in this market. Uh, Infor has been working with 3D Systems now for uh, some time to really help us understand the market here and really uh, work with, with, uh, with this environment here. So, Greg, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, and thanks, and take it away. Good morning. Um, I'd like to go ahead and give you a quick introduction to 3D Systems. Uh, you know, I'm proud today to speak to you um, as, as an end-to-end -end content provider of both uh, 3D content software or 3D generation software, um, but also the uh, ability to print and manufacture um, that content. Um, we're a global player. We've got manufacturing and sales and marketing capabilities uh, throughout the various markets in the world. Uh, 3D Systems has over seven print technologies or print engine technologies that are the basis of, of a pretty wide range of equipment. We're proud that we've got a world-class um, uh, uh, group of customers, over 100 different performance materials, uh, 300, uh, in excess of 300 resellers, and an expanding technology platform. Uh, we still have significantly more patents and intellectual property than we, get, than we do with employees. The company today is focused in really four areas. The first is design productivity software. This is the ability to essentially create 3D content. And while 3D content has always been largely created by CAD software, today that's changing. There's many different uh, applications that can run on iPhones um, that can supply 3D content. There are growing libraries of 3D content that have tools that easily allow people to manipulate and change 3D files for customization. And of course, there's scanning technology that's allowing reverse engineering uh, for the quick replacement or remanufacturing of components. 3D printers uh, has always been the basis of 3D systems. It's the ability to basically uh, additively manufacture plastic and metal parts. Um, but the solution are the materials. Uh, what customers largely ask for are uh, ranges of mechanical properties or capabilities, and that's delivered through the materials. And finally, uh, many customers don't want to own machines, but they want parts fast. And so we have a growing on-demand parts business that allows customers to upload data to a website or email it to us, and then we quickly turn around plastic and metal parts to them in a three- to five-day period on average. Our 3D printing portfolio is complete with personal printers. These are largely used by students, um, inventors, uh, home-based or office-based equipment 
They have a less expensive price range uh, from $1,300 up to about the $20,000 price range. Um, a growing amount of capabilities, while these printers may have started out with um, limitations, uh, the technology continues to improve, and what a customer can get for a very entry-level system is becoming rather significant. This is one of the fastest growing areas of our business. The professional printers are a, uh, a line of production um, type devices that allow customers from the $20,000 to about $250,000 price range the ability to create uh, fairly um, high-end prototypes. And where you see systems like this used are in uh, small to mid-size OEM type customers that have uh, uh, multiple design engineers or multiple sources of data to, to keep up with the production. The final high-end type of equipment is the production equipment. It ranges from about $250,000 to $950,000. It has become the predominant method of manufacturing rapid prototypes by most companies, most service providers that are in the business of supplying um, rapid parts and components. It's also largely depended on by most of the major uh, automotive and aerospace OEMs just because of its cost of ownership, its accuracy, and its ability to keep up with the throughput of having uh, many thousands of engineers uh, in your organization. One of the things that differentiates 3D systems from many of our, our competitors uh, is the range of material choices. The, um, the company has uh, over 100 different material choices from waxes, nylon materials, uh, a range of plastics and rubbers, to metals and even composite materials. And this allows us to do a range of, of kind of unique applications from casting patterns to fully functional parts to um, all of the basic prototypes that our customers require. As I said um, earlier, one of the realities of our business is that people tend to look at this technology and they come to the conclusion that they need it, but they don't want to um, have it in their facility. Either they don't have a facility that can accommodate it, or they don't have a staff that they, uh, they wish to, um, to, to, to man it. And so they take advantage of something that is, is unique in our industry today, and that's an on-demand parts business. It's the ability to send quickly files uh, to 3D systems, and we will manufacture them for our customers and, and FedEx them back or UPS them back uh, on a rapid basis. And this allows customers who either have machines and want to take advantage of additional materials or customers who don't have machines and want to have access to rapid prototyping. This is another area, a fast-growing area of our business. We offer a growing suite of integrated uh, 3D authoring solutions. This allows customers to do things like design. It's essentially CAD-based software. Um, they can also scan uh, device or scan um, parts or scan molds and essentially create or reverse engineer drawings uh, that can be further modified. You know, the example we have on, on the uh, lower right corner is, is um, you know, something that might be sculpted out of wax, and we have a growing suite of tools that would allow um, someone to digitally sculpt, and then, of course, that creates 3D content. 3D content is what drives our printers. That's, uh, that's essentially the data that we're printing. I'm going to focus on the production side of our business. Our production printers uh, are used by a, a fairly impressive set of customers. As I said earlier, they, they tend to be focused on high levels of productivity where uh, many design engineers are sending data uh, to be printed. They're either prototypes or they're end-use parts. And, and we're proud of the customers who have taken advantage of this type of equipment from aerospace to medical um, to automotive and even consumer products. I started a discussion on production printers with sterile lithography. We have an, in total seven models of our sterile lithography platform today. The first two have, um, have essentially morphed into hybrid solutions. Uh, most customers start doing prototyping with some type of 3D printer, and they come away with the impression that 3D printers are fairly easy to use, just like your desktop printer. 
Um, so the first two models, the projects 6,000 and 7,000, we've essentially modified these to be hybrid systems. They're largely based on sterile lithography technology, but they allow customers the ease of use of printers. The other two systems, the iPro 8000 and 9000, are high-end production systems, and they're capable of producing large quantities of very accurate and capable parts. So this slide shows you an example of, of what some customers are producing on devices like the 6000 or 7000, everything from electronic components to parts that they want to functionally test. On the larger systems, they're capable of producing things like dashboards or components to dashboards or patterns that are used in investment casting. So the, the picture on the right side is an example of a cockpit of an unmanned aerial vehicle um, that's used uh, in many different applications from military to, um, to things like you know, fighting forest fi uh, fires and police enforcement. A lot of customers have the perception that machines that are capable of producing large parts lose their ability to print very minute detail, and that's not necessarily true with 3D system stereolithography equipment. It is capable of printing large parts, but also very fine details on small parts, all from the same machine. One of the unique things about stereolithography technology is its range of flexibility. Customers can run many different materials. And in this slide, on a Monday, they might make investment casting patterns. You see an example of a pattern that's essentially a transmission housing. On the next day, they might be doing something like wind tunnel testing patterns. This is a ceramic filled material. Again, these are all produced off the same machine but you're loading essentially an adaptable uh, material delivery system in to change materials. There are clear materials. Many companies, many of the cars that you see at the, at the uh, automotive uh, shows uh, are largely produced on stereolithography machines. Consumer product parts that require tough, durable plastics, functional testing. And then medical materials. There's a growing range of medical materials that have um, a pretty significant range of capabilities uh, for direct medical use, whether they be surgical drill guides or, as the example in this, uh, custom hearing aids. So another range of technology is selective laser sintering. And selective laser sintering also has a wide range of materials that allow it to be used for both uh, production parts. It's probably the most defect technology for, um, for, for use of producing aerospace parts and uh, or parts used directly in the aerospace industry. Um, it also can produce soft, flexible materials. It can produce ultra-strong, tough materials and it can produce medical grade materials or medical grade parts uh, from the materials. One of the most predominant selective laser sintering or SLS systems is the S-Pro60. It's become uh, one of the most successful mid-range prototyping and manufacturing systems because of its cost of ownership and flexibility and up upgradeability. This system can run a full range of materials that, uh, that do basic prototyping with the PA and GF materials, uh, more functional parts for aerospace and medical from the EX and uh, natural and black materials, and then high stiffness and performance materials from HST to flexible materials from Duraform Flux. One of, the, one of the points of differentiation that most customers are impressed with with selective laser sintering is its ability to mimic or come very close to injection molded materials. This slide represents an example of a customer on the left side. They would spend a significant amount of capital dollars making an injection molded tool to make a car seat for, um, for child testing, for, uh, for crash testing of child seats. On the right hand side, we were able to print that same seat using significantly less capital and turning around a functional part in a much quicker period of time, and essentially days as opposed to weeks. 
and the test results of how those par parts perform during crash tests are almost identical. So this is a significant change for a consumer product company that's trying to get to market fast. Another application in aerospace is the ability to make parts um, that are used in the air conditioning system or as parts of the cockpit that are um, all centered, uh, in this case, using EX material. So this is an example of an aerospace company that has specified uh, Duraform EX, and there's 32 parts that are used on each aircraft that essentially complete the heating and air conditioning system of the aircraft. Many customers um, come to the realization that while 3D printing is fast, they, they justify the technology through a, a pretty um, impressive method, and that is the reduction of part counts. Um, in aerospace in particular, every part has to be checked and every part has to be quality controlled. And so this example shows you 15 parts which represent five SKUs. So each one of those parts has to be ordered by a buyer, they have to be uh, incoming inspected, there's drawings associated with them, and there's a level of complexity that, um, that makes this assembly um, a significant event for any type of manufacturer uh, in the aerospace world. An alternative to that is a design engineer to design that 15 parts into one. And that's one SKU, there's no custom tools, there's one assembly check, and there's only one item that a purchasing agent has to manage. And that whole life cycle or value chain is why customers are adopting this technology in aerospace. It is, it is a cost saver for a lot of the aerospace companies. Design engineers love selective laser centering. And one of the reasons why is because when, when we all went to, to uh, design engineering school, we were taught that complexity increases cost. And so as a design engineer, you're constantly um, being tasked with simplifying your designs, which might um, compromise uh, how capable they are or, or how um, impressive they are. In selective laser centering, it, it's no more expensive to manufacture some of these parts that you see on the screen than essentially to make a square block. Um, complexity doesn't add cost with selective laser centering, and design engineers really appreciate that. Accuracy is another reason. One of the things that's become kind of the standard in 3D printing world when it relates to accuracy is the ability to take a physical object and scan it, or part that's 3D printed and scan it, and compare it to the original data. And we call this a delta map. You can essentially map Areas that are green are within tolerance. Areas that go red to orange are out of tolerance. Customers depend on the reliability and the quality and the toughness. We have a, a division of 3D systems called Bespoke that actually makes accessories to prosthetics. And we have people doing mountain biking, playing soccer on these types of devices, and they have to be tough and high quality. Probably the fastest growing area of additive manufacturing or 3D printing involves metals. This is the ability to take metal powder and to additively um, put it together and create metal parts. These can be metal parts from reactive and non-reactive metals. It includes a range of aluminum and titanium, as well as cobalt chrome, stainless steels, and a number of other tooling steels and mirage steels. The main focus of our product line are on what's called the Direct Metal 125 and 250 product line. These are uh, a very reliable, uh, easy to use system that produces direct metal parts. They have a range of laser-based technologies that are actually doing the fusing of the metal powder. They're a turnkey system, meaning that a customer um, can put CAD data in and get metal parts out uh, um, you know, in a single system. Just to summarize, the company's going to continue to increase its ability to generate 3D content and create solutions that consumers, 
design engineers, uh, tools in their toolbox that they can use to essentially make their job of designing 3D content easier. Uh, we think that that's going to provide a tremendous demand for 3D printers. We think that the solution that they're looking for comes from the materials. So we will continue to, to invent and develop a growing range of materials. And for those customers who aren't quite ready to have machines or want to expand the capability of their machines, um, we're excited to offer an on-demand part service that makes it real easy for customers to take advantage of more materials, maybe larger parts, or, um, or just a technology that they're not willing to bring in-house at this point. I want to thank all of you for listening today, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Warren. I think he's going to open it up for questions towards the end of this presentation. Thank you very much. Greg, thank you very much. And, Greg, if you could just drag control back to me, if you would, to Greg, that uh, little green uh, dot back over to my name, if you could. Operator, if uh, I could get control back again, please. All right, Gre uh, Greg, if you could just advance my slide to slide 54, please. I think you still have control. Okay. Okay, uh, so, you know, what we've seen here is the uh, the 3D manufacturing, a lot of capabilities here. But if you're looking to tie this back into your business, some of the best-in-class businesses are really starting to embrace this technology not as an island of, of, uh, of, of engineering, but really bringing it completely into their ERP, completely into the production environment, whether you're running it in a production environment or, for example, a projects-based environment. So what we're seeing here first is being able to take an ERP that has a, it's flexible enough to be able to take that bill of material and routing and Greg gave you the, the uh, indication there of where it was 15 pieces down to one. Being able to, to maintain, though, that details of the material cost and the processing cost for the 3D manufacturing versus the traditional manufacturing, being able to compare them in the ERP so you can make the proper business decision, the proper costing decisions as you go forward. Being able to use your ERP planning and scheduling with these 3D devices, these 3D devices sitting on the, on the production line or in the, uh, in the engineering area, being able to schedule properly so you, you know that what your capacity is, being able to get product moved through there, keeping those machines busy at all times wherever you can. Being able to handle the procurement of raw materials, making that just work within the normal business processes as you go forward. Engineering change management, being able to tie the, the 3D engineering changes that go along with the rest of the business manufacturing, being able to tie it to CAD, being able to tie it to those tool paths, et cetera. For the prototypes, being able to run that as a projects-based manufacturing, being able to drop in the scheduling, the costing, the ties into the manufacturing, being able to, to make sure that uh, you, can, you can manage those accordingly. Some of our best-in-class people, our best-in-class customers that have adopted 3D printing, being able to have integrated PLM. So PLM and the CAD environment is fully integrated with the, with the ERP system and fully integrated with that 3D work center that is uh, occurring or is in the, on the line there. And to wrap it up there, the shop floor control, the SCADA capabilities, being able to get feedback directly from that 3D machine to knowing that a part, where it is, what stage of production it is, so that your customers can full have full visibility and really can take full advantage of your abilities to produce in that 3D uh, manufacturing capabilities. Greg, if you could advance to slide 55, please. With that, I'm going to turn it over here to uh, Naveen, and uh, Naveen is our uh, one of our technologists. And uh, Naveen, so tell us a little bit about, you know, what does a flexible technology mean? Sure, Warren. Thank, thanks for, uh, thanks for, you know, having me on this call. I, I'm pretty excited about 3D technology uh, as, you know, playing a part in disrupt, the disruptive manufacturing in our industry today. And, and the flexible technology that M4 or flexible architecture that M4 is sort of implementing with our ION platform is the ability to connect uh, not only in for non in for application, but also uh, devices and other applications uh, into an environment where you know people can not only 
listen to the conversation between other people, but also follow uh, purchase orders, devices, to make sure that it's a truly collaborative environment. Uh, in, in the past, it, you know, the, our, the enterprise software architecture used to be pretty monolithic. Uh, there, it would involve a significant services effort to even integrate a third-party system to your ERP. Uh, but as we move along, people know that the um, the real value is the ability to integrate best of breed applications and machines uh, in in a cost effective but powerful manner. Uh, if if you want to move this slide ahead, Warren, you can you can see um, next one. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's me. So. <laughs> Uh, so if, if you want to go to the ION architecture, yes, that's uh, what we're trying to do here is one of our imperatives for innovation at Infor is the ability to implement an internet-like architecture. Uh, and and the, the reason we have uh, made the internet architecture our standard is we looked at, you know, what's the biggest technology out there that can be updated uh, or, you know, added upon without really breaking it. So if somebody's up, up you know, updating a site, somebody's connecting something to the internet does not mean we have to take the whole World Wide Web down. Uh, and that's, that's the approach we're using with our um, enterprise software here at Infor, is the ability to make it open to not just Infor applications, but all the applications um, that, that are relevant to the enterprise landscape. So if, if you go to the next slide, Warren, um, um, sorry, I didn't realize there's a transition. Here, uh, if you go to the next slide, you'll, you'll see that we'll have, the way we're doing this uh, is through our ION technology, uh, and which is basically built on an open standard XML framework. Uh, and the reason we chose XML is it's the, it's the language of the internet. It, if you look at an XML code snippet, it basically looks like English, so it's not a lot of effort for you to learn and implement uh, the ION platform into your enterprise landscape. Uh, next slide. All right, so here, here's the meat of it. Uh, so on one end of the spectrum, you have your 3D printing machine, and you have, you know, which is obviously a disruptive uh, technology in itself. Uh, it has the ability to change the, the landscape for prototyping and also for certain specialized manufacturing use cases. But I feel like the true potential for 3D technology in your enterprise is when you make this truly, truly collaborative. Um, and, you know, there was a recent survey by McKinsey which said that knowledge workers today spend about 28 hours per week collaborating on projects and looking for the right information, which is basically more than 50% of your work week. But what if you could bring together technologies like 3D printing with your devices and the right people and make it in, into an environment where your research and development team has the ability to see what manufacturing is doing, or testing is doing, or if a mold is all ready for pickup uh, from the lathe machine, uh, and you as the production manager have the ability to track, uh, you know, a design from concept to production and make sure that every little, uh, you know, requirement is taken care of. Uh, that truly brings in not only the collaborative aspect of um, 3D printing, but also makes the, the whole process visible to the right people in the company. Uh, and, and that's where I see our open architecture being, uh, you know, adding value to the 3D printing technology. It, it's taking this disruptive technology uh, and then bringing out the social aspects of it so people can move products from concept to reality uh, in a more efficient manner. Uh, and we're actually doing this right now with a certain instances in some of our customer areas, not necessarily in manufacturing, uh, but we've done this in hospitality where we're trying to link uh, air conditioning units from different rooms uh, to a monitoring system which would automatically shut down certain air conditions if, if a section of the hotel is not being used. Uh, and we're adapting this open architecture onto the manufacturing environment to follow people, applications, machine, and data. So. That's where I see our open architecture and social collaboration merging together to, you know, take the 3D printing technology forward. Good. 
Very good. Thank you, Naveen. And uh, so let's just kind of wrap up here some uh, takeaways. The fact is that 3D manufacturing, additive manufacturing, it's gone way beyond prototypes. You talk, we talked about the laser centering, the ability to produce medical products, really moving, moving these machines right onto the production floor to produce finished goods. Being able to integrate engineering, getting the, the engineering to ERP to the machines and back again to all the SCADA connections as well. Flexibility is absolutely key. This is a market that is really still well under uh, a state of change here. We're going to be seeing some very exciting uh, you know, capabilities here coming out in the next two to three years. Make sure that whatever systems that you have, your ERP systems, your business systems are in place, make sure that those are capable going forward. And make sure you're teamed up with a partner that is understanding the marketplace, understanding and working with companies such as the 3D systems to make sure that yeah, that you're really partnering up with the right uh, right organization as we go through. One of the things, too, is make sure you, you evaluate your total supply chain. Make sure that you're taking a look and saying, you know, I can take 3D, so the 3D uh, additive manufacturing methodologies and really – what really can it do for me overall, end to end, from my supplier all the way to my finished customer? Perhaps it's even taking your customer, putting a printer on site, and actually printing your product on their site. That might make sense for you. Ultimately, too, is you really also have to control that intellectual property, too. So beware. Make sure that you've got good control of it because uh, you want to make sure that, uh, you know, if anybody can print with 3D, you want to make sure that uh, you're controlling it and retaining your capabilities as well there. Uh, next slide, please. So with that, I'm going to turn it back over to our operator to open up the lines for question and answers. Hopefully that uh, our audience here has, uh, which has hung with us here through a few technical difficulties, but uh, has hung with us. We still have a large number of attendees, and hopefully we've got a few uh, good calls coming here. Yeah, at this time, I'd like to remind everyone, in order to ask a question, press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. We'll pause for a moment to compile the Q&A roster. Okay, your first question comes from Jim from Rust Master of Texas. Your line is open. Hi, Jim. How are you? Great. Good morning. Thank you for uh, including me in this presentation. Um, my company uses uh, Sightline as our ERP system, yes. and uh, we manufacture uh, large uh, uh, propulsion systems for seagoing vessels. And uh, I'm interested to know if uh, you've done any integration work between uh, Sightline and uh, the 3D printing systems that we saw earlier, and also if you've done any integration work between Sightline and any other uh, uh, shop floor uh, machine control systems. Yeah, there's been uh, been some work done uh, along. We're working with some, with 3D right now to uh, to build some uh, integrations out. You know, one of the things with Sightline built on the Mongoose environment, very open, and uh, then taking a look at, for example, the OPC technologies as well uh, in order to get the the SCADA interfaces. So the answer is in short term is yes. Um, a lot of it has been been done so far one offs. Um, you know, again, the technology is relatively new. Uh, upside of Sightline is, uh, as well as some of the other N4 ERPs with the ION technology as well, very flexible to do this. So uh, it's definitely something we would like to uh, to take uh, further with you. Okay. Well, would you be able to provide some information about the, the type of work that you've done? Uh, we can take that uh, and, and do that offline. Yes, sir, I could. Okay. Great. Thanks. Your next question comes from Tim from American Roller. Your line is open. Hi, Tim. What is the largest size of part that the direct metal machines can manufacture? Greg, I'm going to let you take that one if you would. It, um, current build size is limited to 250 millimeter by 250 millimeter by 300 millimeter. So uh, within that within that build area, um, you know that is that is your effective build area. So. Um, and you can build basically at the, uh, you know, at the diagonal of the build area to achieve, um, you know, essentially a, a, a wider, um, but you have to stay within that, that 250 by 250 by 300 area. And do you anticipate any machines in the near future that will make, uh, open that window up? Uh, we do. You know, 3D Systems recently uh, announced uh, an acquisition that, that should significantly expand our metals capabilities. Very good. Thank you. Your next question comes from George from Radio. Your line is open. Good morning. 
I was wondering, aside from your own software, is there a preferred 3D software? Is it uh, Rhino? Is it SolidWorks? Or you mentioned something about it being applications even being available on a cell phone these days. Yeah, the um, you know 3D systems uh, operates on what's called an, an, an STL file. We were one of the original um, creators of this format, and all of your major CAD software packages from uh, Katia to uh, you know Pro E, um, SolidWorks, um, Autodesk, they all output. A, um, an STL file. Uh, some of them even output uh, another format called ZPR, which is a color file format. So um, on our systems that can print color, uh, that's essentially the format that is um, that's used. The, um, the the applications on cell phones, um, you know, are are kind of unique. Probably the most um, Impressive one is where you can take a, a picture uh, of, a, of a person using the panoramic feature on an iPhone, and, and that has the ability um, to create uh, an STL file. So, you know, I don't want to um, say that it works perfect 100% of the time, um, but six months or nine months ago, if you would have told me uh, someone could do that on a, on, a, on a cellular telephone, I would have uh, said I, I didn't think that was possible. And, and um, I recently saw that done at a trade show. So I think that um, it's really kind of the beginning of, of some of the applications that you see um, on phones. Another area that I think you're going to see kind of expand um, with some of this um, remote technology with tablets and phones is just the ability to open files and look at them and view them. You know, engineers aren't tied to their desks. They're, they're on the shop floor. They're out visiting customers. And it requires the ability to open CAD files and look at CAD files and look at files in a three-dimensional perspective. And all of these uh, mobile tools, whether they be cell phones or, or tablets, are going to facilitate that. So um, this isn't something that's going to, by any means, um, you know, atrophy. It's only going to grow in the future. Do you have available any kind of demos of your own software? You know, the best um, chance for you to take advantage of, of 3D software is, uh, is on our Cubify website, and that's Cubify.com. So there's, there's a couple of different applications where you can take pictures. You know, you can use your cell phone to essentially take pictures, and then that picture can be used to create a personalized figurine. Um, so if you go to Cubify.com, you can take a look at kind of some of our existing libraries of content and capabilities and applications. All right, I think that'll do it for me. I appreciate it. Thank you. Your next question comes from Joe from Honeywell. Your line is open. Hey, Joe, good morning. Good morning. Um, so I have a couple of questions. Um, first one is, do you, do the machines have the ability to integrate metal into plastic? N not at this both? point. Most of most most of your systems are dedicated. They're either plastics or metals, and and uh, and they are separate systems. So you, you wouldn't uh, run plastics in a metals machine, and you wouldn't run metals in a plastics machine. Okay, but you talked about some of the higher end machines having the ability to do both, right? Um, the higher end metals machines can run both reactive and non-reactive metals. Um, again, it's not common for customers to run uh, plastics and metals on the same machine. They're, they're essentially manufactured in different methods. Um, one's, one's more of an oven-based technology where you're, you're warming the material up to its melt point, and, and the metals is more of a fusion-based where you're, you're uh, using a very high-powered laser to create the energy to, uh, you know, to center the particles of metal together. So while they, while they sound similar, there's actually a little different science going on in the process. No, I, yeah, I understand the differences there. That's why I was wondering if there was um, a collaborative effort there internal to the machine that it could cross over and do those. Okay. Um, what about um, how have you guys spent material costs? Have you found the material cost to be competitive? You know, in many ways, um, if you look at the total cost of ownership, so what it costs to, um, to create a mold, what it costs to maintain the mold, what it costs to um, modify a mold if there's any design changes, and then, of course, the cost of the part. When you add all that up, 
it's frequently less expensive, uh, particularly on low volume parts, um, to use any of these additive manufacturing techniques. Um, if you don't consider those costs, if you just look at what it costs to produce an injection molded part or what you can, uh, you know, what you pay per piece for an injection molded part or a machine part, it's frequently more economical, but that's not looking at the total cost of ownership. And, and um, you know, the example I gave in aerospace um, is, is, a, is a very real application. I mean, it's a very real example. I mean, there's, there's many different aerospace companies that are going through this, particularly in organizations, you know, like the Manufacturers Association of Replacement Aerospace Parts, where, you know, you're trying to make parts um, in small quantities that are, um, you know, being uh, required by, um, you know, by different airline manufacturers. And the reason why they use additive manufacturing is they simply don't have high enough volumes to justify the cost of traditional manufacturing. So they look for an alternative. Okay. That's good. That's, those are my questions. Thank you. Thank you. Your next question comes from Don from UTC. Your line is open. Hi. Don. Go ahead, please. Okay, if your line is on mute, could you please unmute your line? Okay, your next question comes from Scott from Novellus. Your line is open. Uh, good Thank morning, you. Scott. Um, can your ERP system, if it had a configurator, uh, use that to drive the uh, drawings and dimensions of the part you want to make? That's something that we're looking at um, and to see if we can uh, take those replaceable parameters and uh, push them into the, uh, the configuration. So uh, that is something we, were, we would like to do. Um, we have not uh, gone down that route quite yet, but uh, it's, it's something that uh, we would definitely see as a, as, as a benefit there. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from Stephen from ITW. Your line is open. Hi, Stephen. Thank you, uh, and good morning. Uh, my question uh, con concerns the, um, the the slow uh, build rate, you know, the current uh, additive manufacturing machines. What technologies do you see in the future to uh, increase the speed of printing, you know, like multi-heads or, uh, you know, other technologies? You know, the, the technology is probably going to... Um, improve from uh, from what I would call um, blending or mixing of different technologies, maybe be, maybe adding uh, multiple print heads or multiple lasers. Um, you know, if you look at just the relative history of the industry, the speed improvements have come from just improvements in chemistry. So, you know, how, how fast the materials react um, and also kind of some of the supporting technology like sensors and heating technology. Um, you know, that's allowed us to keep the process more under control, um, which, you know, as the process um, starts to evolve, you'll start to take basically time out of, the, uh, of each individual layer, and that will yield a substantial speed improvement. If you, if you think of your desktop printer, you know, if you can um, take out all the little pauses and stops and starts that that device makes, you could, you could print faster. And we're taking advantage of those same types of capabilities. That, that comes from, you know, higher end computing power to uh, to better sensor and and um, and you know motion control technology. Thank you. Okay, your next question comes from Eiler from Great Day Inc. Your line is open. Uh, yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, my question is in regards to the powder coating uh, paint system software. Uh, I noticed that was a part of the presentation. Um, it, it, can you kind of just tell me how that software we, – we, uh, we use a powder coater in our manufacturing operation here in Louisiana, and, uh, but we, we manually control the, the whole unit uh, literally with one person. Uh, and we don't have any software in place, and it's by far the largest piece of equipment on our property. So um, can you outline for me some of the benefits uh, of using software with a, with a powder coating system? Greg, do you want to take that one? Or 
You know, I don't. I don't know if I'm. I mean, I'm, I don't think I'm qualified to answer that. I'm sorry. Okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I might have to take that one offline and do a bit a bit more uh, research on that one. Uh, you, okay. You, you well, just help me a little bit on that one. Yeah. Well, one more question too. Um, while I got you, uh, do, do you have any in addition to your CAD 3D software? Uh, do you have any um, software? Uh, that's available uh, for point of purchase displays, uh, which would be used uh, in an in-store retail environment. Um, you know, not at this point. Not that. Uh, not not as I understand your question. I mean, we have um, you know we have a number of of web commerce type tools, and many of our customers um, create point of purchase displays, but they use traditional uh, CAD tools that um, where they'll design everything from, you know, a display that holds makeup to a display that's holding children's toys um, to a display that uh, is holding, um, you know, sporting goods. And um, additive manufacturing is, is exceptional for uh, allowing different marketing organizations or focus groups to see a range of different options and make decisions as to which one they think is most attractive. Um, all of that today is, is, is uh, in my experience, designed using traditional um, CAD engineering design software. And I think this is where you start getting into the uh, those integrations between, let's say, your ERP. Uh, you know, if you take a look at Enforce portfolio for ERPs, there are point of sale uh, capabilities on, on a number of those products, and being able to uh, place that order and uh, kick it off, you know. Where, where the product is actually being produced in the, uh, we'll call it the work cell, and that work cell happens just to be a, a uh, defined as a 3D printer, and being able to uh, to feed the information for to the 3D printer on demand through the ERP. Your next question comes from Max from Team Industries. Your line is open. Hi, Max. Good morning. Good morning. I have a question on your direct metal machines. Have you done any development work with uh, printing high-pressure die-casting cavities for molds? Um, I'm not aware of, uh, of a customer using it for that application, but um, we we actually do uh, a process similar to, um, to die-casting quality using uh, additive manufacturing. And, and here's how it, um, it typically proceeds. We take the customer data, uh, we, using sterilography we make a positive and then um, through a number of steps we, we get to essentially a plaster cavity and, um, and then we are able to cast aluminum or magnesium in that plaster cavity uh, to generate um, die cast like rapid prototype parts. So direct metal probably at some point can do this. Um, you know, as as a, a essentially making a tool, but as I said um, at the start, I'm not aware of of any diecast uh, foundries doing this at this point. Okay, thank you. Your next question comes from Don from UTC. Your line is open. Hi, Don. Go ahead, please. Hello, Don. If your line is on mute, could you please unmute your line? Your next question comes from Brian from Debso. Your line is open. Hi, Brian. How's it going, guys? Um, I had a question regarding the production rate of the machines. Is it comparable to um, other production type machines, can it turn around? Like, turn around? You know, the, a build time is um, is always specific to the uh, the part you're building, and it's almost always uh, determined by the height, the Z height of the part. So the the more layers that have to be added together to create, you know, the complete physical part, um, you know, basically you sum that and it and it comes to your total build time. You know, typically we see um, builds taking as long uh, as um, you know, it's 24 hours, 
and 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 we do see customers who are able to um, complete builds in as short as two to three hours. Uh, and the difference is the the height of the parts you're building, or the you know the total amount of layers you're adding together to complete the build. Greg, you may want to mention uh, the ability to do some nesting and uh, multi outs, correct? Yeah, one of the reasons why 3D systems equipment is largely used by service providers or, or the larger OEMs is our equipment has a lot of features built into it, like nesting. Um, for example, on 3D, uh, for selective laser sintering, you take advantage of the, um, of the X, Y, and Z build area. So you can stack part on top of part on top of part. And as I said, the more you stack, um, the longer it will take to build. But these machines largely run unattended. So many customers start them at 4 or 5 in the afternoon. They're building all throughout the evening. And then when they come in the next morning, um, their, their parts are finished. So where they require more capacity or more throughput, they're essentially uh, stacking or nesting parts, taking advantage of the complete build area. And, and in fact, it is possible with selective laser centering to add parts after the machine has started building. So you could, you could start the machine into a build mode, and then if an engineer walks into your office and says, listen, I need this by tomorrow morning, um, you can add it to the build area, and the machine will calibrate how much additional build time it requires and answer that engineer right then and there, okay, it'll be ready or no, it won't be ready, um, depending on you know, how many additional layers are added to the total build time. Exactly. You know, that, uh, Greg, you just brought up an interesting point of where we were looking at and we were kicking around the ideas of, you know, how does that affect your ERP scheduling, for example, because that's somewhat unique of being able to, uh, you know, start a job and then in mid-cycle be able to change the job uh, and add additional parts to it. So uh, definitely one of those things that, that drives that flexibility. Okay, again, to ask a question, press star 1 on your telephone keypad. Your next question comes from Don from UTC. Your line is open. Uh, hello. I'm not so sure if uh, you mentioned about I'm from UTC, and uh, I tried to get online. Actually, my name is Chen. Does that happen that you have another Don from UTC or Chen? Uh... Go ahead. You're, you're connected. Go ahead, please. Yeah, yes. Uh, my, my question is, is um, could you give us a best estimate what is the hourly rate for each of the processes, one for the metal laser center and the other ones for the plastic? You know, it's, um, it's not um, – it's not really quoted on an hourly rate. What I would encourage you to do is to, uh, you know, take your CAD file and you can go to www.quickparts.com. You can upload your file, select the material you want, select the process you want, and it will quote you a price for that exact part. And it will even give you a calendar and allow you to select when you want delivery. And typically, um, you know, uh, price does increase for faster deliveries. Um, if you can wait five days, you will pay less for that same part than if you can, uh, if you need it tomorrow. So um, that's, that's um, the most accurate way to, to really answer uh, how much a part costs because each, each part, you know, we are calculating um, each part on an individual basis. Oh, my, my purpose is I try to uh, give, uh, to have an, uh, a rough estimate we don't need to be exact before this is just for the information before we can load anything up to your system. That's an IT issue we need to address. And uh, we just like uh, to approach, uh, like, you know, if it's feasible. Uh, it, so far, my understanding is the process much suitable for prototype might be, could be applied for some production, low volume, but have to be high value part. So that a limitation set right there. Uh, if you cannot provide me an estimated cost, is fine with me. And I don't think we are able to load anything into your system right now to to obtain the estimated cost. Uh, my second question is: um, Have you established for the metal laser center, for example, uh, any material standard, process standard, acceptance criteria? Certification and qualification and finishing spec. With, um, your with, metal, 
with with, um, with metals in particular, it's probably the uh, most immature uh, of all of the additive manufacturing technologies, um, only because it's really started to uh, evolve quite rapidly in the past five years. And you know, this industry is still relatively immature. It's it's a 30 year old industry in total, and uh, metals have been you know one of the most exciting improvements in the last five, maybe eight years uh, of that total 30-year history. With, to answer your question with standards, there are um, a number of efforts going on with standards. Uh, the most um, recent one that I'm familiar with is ASTM standards, and it's an organization called F42 that is uh, made up of a number of companies in aerospace and even automotive that are uh, trying to develop standards for additive manufacturing. It's not specifically only metals. It's it's also plastics, and um, and and that's something that um, is is you know ongoing and, and in the works at this point. Thank you. Your next question comes from Paul from Scientific Drilling. Your line is open. Hi, Paul. Uh, thank you. Good morning. Um, I was wondering if you have any data on relative strength of a sintered part versus um, an identical part made out of bar stock? Uh, yes, we do. I mean, if, if you can uh, um, follow up with me via email, I mean, I can send you uh, some data sheets that, um, that do some comparison. I don't want to say it's an exact comparison because there's, um, you know, there's, there's some need to be very specific as to what type of alloy. Um, some alloys match up better than others. And um, and so it's uh, but but there is there is a growing amount of data that's available, and um, and we certainly can provide you a data sheet of what are expected mechanical properties from the current sintering process. All right, thank you. Okay, again to ask a question, press star one on your telephone keypad. Okay, there are no further questions queued up at this time. All right, uh, Greg, if you could advance the slide once more here, please, for me. We have uh, up and coming. Uh, I'd like uh, everyone to join us here for our next webinar, the Pulse of Manufacturing Series, Regulatory Compliance and Quality Control. As a matter of fact, we had uh, some good quality control or quality questions coming up here, so you may want to attend the July 25th, 11 a.m. Eastern Daylight Time. Register at www.info.com slash events. So with that, uh, thank you very much for joining us. We hope that uh, this was valuable to you, and we look forward to uh, seeing many of you on our future uh, WebExes here. Thank you very much.